Hello everyone. Good evening. So, as Peter mentioned, my name is Vladimir. Uh, I'm the solutions architect at Amazon Web Services now for more than four and a half years. Uh, I mostly work with the customers in Central Eastern Europe, uh, focusing ideally in Czech and Slovak Republic, uh, but also other countries like Hungary, uh, Romania, and so on. And today's topic uh, that I will try to present here is serverless on AWS architectural patterns and best practices. And I actually would like to kind of split it into two halves. Uh, the first half should be focused on uh, those people that probably don't have that much serverless experience. And second uh, would be more interesting for those that are more experienced. So if you consider yourself as an advanced user and so on, Feel free to take an app or something, I'll try to wake you up before the second part. Uh, so before I move on, first question to you here. Who considers himself as an advanced user? Please raise your hand in serverless. Okay, about a third approximately. So feel free to take an app. Uh, let's move on. So evolution of computing. Uh, I'm not going to start in the old stone ages. Although, you know, some of the setups might be very similar to those. And I mean the setups of the physical servers in data centers. Because not that long time ago, uh, it was the only way how to deploy the code, how to do stuff. So you had the, like, all the bunch of servers, install operating system, harden, configure, whatever you have to do, install databases, and then take care for that and hug the servers during the nights if something goes wrong. Uh, later on, we moved uh, or we, we introduced the so-called virtualization to the data centers. And I myself spent more than five years uh, doing virtualization in uh, my previous jobs. It was fun because it was a combination of operating systems, networking, storage, and so on. And it allowed us to uh, be more efficient with the resources that were running on the servers. But still, you had to deal with those, right? And then, not that long time ago, with the birth of the, of the cloud, we were able to move our workloads to the cloud. Each step was better and better. However, um, still, <coughs> uh, when we moved to virtual servers, uh, we did all the benefits, like you see higher utilization, you know, improved uptime, and so on. Uh, however, uh, moving to the cloud brought even more benefits. So replacing your capital expenses for operational expenses, you don't need to order the hardware anymore. Uh, you can scale really quickly. We heard in the previous uh, session that you can use auto scale and within like minutes have thousands of servers if you want to and if you need to, uh, to be very elastic, you know, agile and so on. Uh, however, even when you run your servers in the cloud, those EC2 instances, you still need to admin administer those virtual servers. You need to still manage the capacity and utilization, so you need to know uh, how much hardware you need when it comes to the CPU, RAM, network, storage. So whether you uh, will scale horizontally, that means adding more servers, or you have to scale vertically, that means like adding more resources to existing servers, more RAM and so on. Uh, and you have to manage high availability, uh, fault tolerance, making sure data gets replicated across availability zones within a region. So for those who don't know, it's physical data centers. And if you have some special jobs that you need to run just for a few minutes, but on a regular basis, it's still expensive because the server has to run 24 seven, regardless the workload of or not. You are not, for a job that we run one minute, you are not going to start a new server because it doesn't make sense. Just starting a new server might take you like five minutes. I then one minute job, then you shut it down. Might make sense in some workloads because in AWS you pay for seconds that your machines are running, but it's not very agile and efficient way. So there is the next step of evolution that's called serverless. And let me stop for a second here. If uh, I say serverless, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? No Please servers. tell me, someone. No servers. No, no servers? servers? Good. Lambda. Lambda, yes. Something else? Function as a service. Very nice. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, 
So serverless means, at least from Amazon point of view, uh, these things, no servers to provision. Thank you very much. Uh, it scales uh, with usage. I will speak about the details in a few minutes. You never have to pay for idle. So if your code isn't running, you pay zero, nada, nothing. And it's automatically available and fault tolerant within that respective region. I like to quote uh, Werner Vogels, uh, Amazon CTO, who says, no server is easier to manage than no server. I know it might sound strange, but it has logic behind it, right? If you have no servers to manage, your job is much, much easier. For customer, serverless means many things. It might be greater agility, less overhead, because there is nothing to take care for, uh, better focus, so you focus on your code, not on the underlying infrastructure, increased scale, again, you don't have to make these decisions like how many servers we need to provision, in what configuration, and so on. More flexibility and faster time to market, because you just deploy your code, and it is available to your users or customers. So, I heard here one of the first things, or first associ association that comes to mind, speaking about serverless Lambda. Lambda is a service that has been introduced in uh, reInvent 2014, just a few weeks uh, before I joined AWS. And for me, as a, as a person that spent, at that time, around 12 years with infrastructure, with all those servers, networking, it was kind of a strange to grasp this service. You just deploy the code and it runs. It sounds strange what, what I'm going to do as an infrastructure guy. As it turned out, nothing, right? And <laughs> <laughs> we'll speak about the details in a second. So <coughs> what is uh, Lambda? It's a function as a service, basically. We heard it here as well. That it's triggered by some event source. This, uh, this source might be change in data state, for example, you add a new item into database, you put some object into the S3 storage. Uh, it might be a request uh, to endpoints, API gateway, we'll speak about uh, that in a few minutes, or changes in a resource state. <coughs> so the function that you can, or the language that you can uh, program in Lambda, uh, there's lots of choices. So the first one that we introduced in 2014 back then was Node.js, then we added Python, currently in version 3.7, if I'm not wrong, Java, C Sharp, Go, Ruby, and last year, we introduced this concept of buy your R, bring your own runtime. <coughs> in other words, if you want to have Lambda to develop in language like PHP, or COBOL, or Fortran, if anyone recalls what that is here, uh, you can do that. You bring your own runtime, and if you fit within the uh, Lambda limits, you can bring it there, and yeah, you have your code running in Fortran, whatever. And of course, on the right side, we have Lambda does something, right? It doesn't run just for your pleasure. It usually accesses some resources. It might be database, it might be some storage, whatever you think about. The anatomy of the Lambda function consists of three basic things. First is the handler function. The handler function is basically this function, your code, the function that is going to be executed uh, upon uh, invocation. Then it's the event object that is data sent uh, to the Lambda function during the invocation, and then it's the context, which are the methods uh, that are available. Uh, when it comes to the pricing, I already mentioned, you never pay for idle. So if your Lambda code isn't running, you pay zero. Uh, this pricing is fine-grained in a meaning that uh, you just decide how much uh, RAM you want to have available for your Lambda function. It starts at 128 max, and then with 64 max increments, you can grow up to 3 gigs, uh, and the time that it runs. Uh, so we uh, bill you on 100 milliseconds increments, so one tenth of a second. So if, uh, if your code runs 2 seconds, then you are built for uh, 20 times 100 uh, milliseconds increment. No hourly, daily, or monthly minimum. So you, if you don't run in that month nothing, you don't pay nothing. You pay nothing, sorry. And uh, what is uh, important is very generous, the free tier. Uh, for those uh, that already 
opened their AWS accounts, you know that in first 12 months, you have free tier. So you can use some services, to a certain extent, of course, uh, free of charge. <coughs> Example, T2 micro instance running full month and paying nothing. 5 GB of storage in S3 paying nothing. Lambda goes beyond 12 months. So even after those 12 months you have the account, the first 1 million requests and 400,000 GB seconds of compute free of charge. So it's peanuts, it's nothing. You don't pay anything for that. Uh, when it comes to improvements to Lambda, there are plenty of them. It's, it's one of those AWS services that every month you get a lot of new stuff and just keeping pace like what we released, what kind of improvement, what kind of integration we brought uh, becomes a full-time job, almost. Um, everything that runs in AWS has to have permissions. And Lambda has to have two false permission. First permission is the execution policy. In other words, what can Lambda do in AWS? So for example, if you want Lambda to store something in a stream or store something in a database, DynamoDB, it has to have permission. Basic, typical Lambda execution policy does just one thing, it stores logs in the CloudWatch and that's it. The rest you have to define yourself. And the second part of the permissions is are the function policies. In other words, what event, this is the source that basically triggers the Lambda, has permission to run the Lambda. With uh, resource policies, you can do it actually across accounts. So if you have like two AWS accounts or more of those, you can run Lambdas in another account if you have this permission set up properly. Here are these three execution models that Lambda can be run. First is synchronous, a push model from Amazon API Gateway, where it just triggers some kind of API action and runs Lambda code. There are asynchronous events, so when you put object into the S3 or you put a message into the SNS, it can trigger the Lambda, but it's kind of fire and forget thing. Just fires the, the function and doesn't care about the return uh, value or anything like that. And the third model, it's pole based. It's ideal for things like SQS, for DynamoDB or Amazon Kinesis, where Lambda, on a regular basis, checks for changes in those systems and basically pulls it and does any kind of action you set up in Lambda. The use cases, we'll speak about a little more during the uh, architectural patterns, but uh, customers run Lambda basically for everything that you can imagine. These are the web applications, and I will show you in the second half of the presentation demo, where hopefully it will work, uh, where we will have like live page. Uh, you can have backends for mobile and IoT services, uh, data processing. So many uh, MapReduce jobs that run a few minutes. Uh, it's important to keep in mind one thing that I forgot uh, to mention. Maximum amount of time that the Lambda function is running is 15 minutes. <coughs> so if you have jobs that will take more than 15 minutes, Lambda is probably not your ideal use case. So if you have any kind of these use cases that run less than 15 minutes, data processing, no problem. Chatbots, if you program chatbots in AWS Lex or Amazon Lex, uh, you power the logic with Lambda functions. Uh, I suppose you know Alexa, this Pringles box this size, or actually Puck, it's probably Puck, that is able to respond to your queries in different languages, so English, uh, German, and so on. Uh, so also you can program your own functions, your so-called Alexa skills, with Lambda as well. And the last one is the IT automation, <coughs> where you basically glue together different functions of the AWS environment and basically extend the functionality with your Lambda code. Um, another thing that we introduced, if I'm not wrong, like a year ago, is the AWS serverless application repository. So you don't have to deploy your own Lambda code. You can use some from the repository that is there available for you, and you can play with it and run it. Before we go to demo, I need to mention one more service that is also completely serverless, and it's used many times in conjunction with Lambda. 
It's called API Gateway. API Gateway allows you to create unified API front-end for your applications. It has already built in the DDoS protection and can also be throttling. If you set up some limit, how many calls per, uh, uh, per minute, per second, uh, someone can make, you can set up this throttling. Uh, you can integrate this with authentication and authorization with service like Cognito. Again, I will show you in the demo later on today. And you can you know, meter, monetize API calls, and so on. This is the example how it looks like with API Gateway. On the left side, you have users that are accessing <coughs> it, whether it's mobile application, website, then, of course, through internet and CDN, Content Distribution Network. They are accessing your web application, uh, making API call through the API Gateway, which is, of course, monitored with uh, CloudWatch monitoring. You can have also cache enabled if you want to uh, respond much quicker than doing the calls to the backend. And in the backend, you can have basically anything you can imagine, whether it's Lambda function, whether there are endpoints running on the EC2 or deployed with Elastic Beanstalk, and any other AWS services, which can also be in your private VPCs in your networks. So let's go to the very simple demo. So first, already on the AWS console, for those who never saw AWS console before, um, and I'm in region island. So here you can choose which region you want to run. So for those that just start use uh, AWS, it happens many times that they deploy something and they cannot find it anymore. Just check your region where you deploy this stuff because most probably you are switched to different region. And then when you switch to the original, you will find your thing. So Lambda. I have only one function here that will be part of the second demo today. So I'll just create my first function. I'll order from, uh, order from scratch. So my first lambda is the name. I'll choose the runtime. So this is what we support right now, whether it's .NET, Go, Java, Node, Python, and so on. So I'll go with Python. Uh, you have to set this uh, execution permissions. So what it will do. And I will lay, leave this just to create a new role with this basic Lambda permissions that will store the logs in CloudWatch. So I will click on create function. Usually it doesn't take that long. <laughs> So um, here are the three parts. Here's the trigger that can trigger the lambda that you can choose from. And there are plenty of services, as I already mentioned, whether it's API Gateway, IoT, Alexa Skills, uh, Application Load Balancer, CloudWatch Events, Code Commit, and so on and so on. Uh, even the third parties uh, events from um, customer, from the providers like Datadog, OneLogin, uh, Sugar, CRM, and so on. I'm not going to program any trigger right now. I'll leave as it is. And here's what the Lambda does. So as I mentioned, it's a basic execution function. So it just stores the logs in the CloudWatch. So I will leave as it is. And here's my code. Very simple. It just imports the JSON library, uh, runs this uh, default handler function. So we have on the left side here the name of the Lambda function, which is Lambda function EY. The name of the function is Lambda handler. And here, the handler info is the combination of both of them. Basically, name of the file, so lambda function, dot, uh, and the handler, so name of the, of the function of the definition. So what it does, it just returns some JSON status code 200 and uh, dumps a message, uh, hello lambda. OK, I don't need to do much more right now, so I will do the test. So you need to create a test event. Uh, I will keep this event uh, template that is called hello world. I will call it my test event, but I'm not processing any data. So I don't need any input values, so I'll leave just the empty JSON. So I'll create that. Okay, now I've created this my test event. I run <coughs> test, and I see green.
color, which is always a good sign. When it's red, not that good. And yeah, this is the result. So uh, stethoscope 200 and body. What is uh, interesting to see is the duration. <coughs> so the, the execution of the function took 14 seconds, but we had something that's called initial duration or init duration. Uh, this init duration is a time when uh, you run your Lambda code basically for the first time. So when there is no sandbox available for uh, your code to execute. This is Python, so it took like one tenth of a second. <coughs> if you will have Java, then probably that initial runtime will be much higher because of the Java runtime. Uh, keep that in mind that um, this initial execution or execution of the Lambda function that hasn't been run for quite some time will take this initial duration. So if you have any kind of uh, latency sensitive uh, applications, keep that in mind. Uh, so despite the fact it runs 14 milliseconds, we will be built for uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, and the resource that we configured in the function was this minimum 128 max, uh, and we ate out of that uh, 56. Um, if we want to see any details in the logs, uh, sorry, before we do that, I want to show you one more thing. It's the monitoring. So you can see the CloudWatch metrics when they successfully load in here. So you will see like how many invocations of the functions we had, uh, whether those calls were successful or not. And uh, while it logs, um, let's go to the cloud management. Uh, cloud so you see the details of that. So you saw that 1747 UTC time, um, this request started, it ended, and the report, all the other information that we already saw on the console. So how long it took, <coughs> how much RAM it took, and so on. So as we had only one invocation, yeah, those graphs won't be that much interesting. Duration, how long it took, how was the error count, whether there was any need for throttling or anything like that. Uh, you can see that uh, here. Uh, one more thing that I would like to mention, especially for those that uh, run or start to work with Lambda, is, so it was the code that we had. You can also set up environment variables. Uh, it will be one of the things in the best practices, but I will mention it right now. Uh, don't hard code environment variables if you can avoid that. Use this uh, advantage of having environment variables. Um, execution role, it's here. And basic second, here you set how many, uh, how much RAM you need for your function execution. As you see, minimum is 128, maximum are three gigs. And this is also important, uh, especially when you have any uh, functions that take more than this initial uh, three seconds. So here you set maximum duration of your function execution. So this three seconds or yeah, three seconds does not mean the function will run three seconds. It will run maximum three seconds. So if I would have a code that needs more than three seconds, it would fail. It would not execute. It will just you know fail at three seconds. It will just kill it, and you will have the message that it has been killed after you know those three seconds. So you need to set up like high limit. This is kind of protection if you have any lambda function that might hang out or whatever, that it will not run forever, or those 15 minutes, which is the maximum limit as of now, uh, that you can kill it sooner than uh, it's the maximum threshold. Um, good, this is from uh, Lambda function. I already mentioned we have something that's called, uh, create a function here. Internet is not very quick in here right now. We have something, this serverless app repository. So you can choose a function from there. You don't need to create your own. Currently, there are 469 public applications. But if you are a company, you can have private applications. So you can create your own Lambda code and share within your company, within AWS account, and you will find it in the private repository. Uh, from the public, I would like to show you one uh, kind of game that's called the Magic 8 Ball, created by my colleague from Poland, Tomasz. And what it does, if you are um, having a day that you don't know how to decide 
you might run this serverless application that will, that will help you to make your decision. So let me just deploy it. Uh, it will take something like a minute, approximately. And what it does in the background, uh, it, uh, it uh, runs the CloudFormation template. So for those who don't know, CloudFormation template is a basic definition of your environment. So infrastructure as a code, you can put in AWS Cloud all your data center into one JSON or YAML file and then you know version control it and all those kind of things. So if we want to see how it's what's happening in the cloud formation stack, we'll just go there and you can see the, the events then in the background is creating some resources like role, uh, the function, uh, some APIs and here is a little bit uh, easier to see. So it seems like it's deployed right now. So let's go to test the application. Um, here's the function. So as you see, the trigger in here is the API gateway. So let's check the, uh, the address, the API endpoint. And if you want uh, to try it with me, you can do as well. I will try to shorten uh, this uh, link for you in a, a bit LY. I hope this is it. So bit ly 2 mhlzm 4 still a lot of characters, uh, but yeah, now uh, just try it if you want to. I'll give you like a minute to do it on your own. If it works, great. If it doesn't, yeah, I'm in trouble. Does it work? Yes. Yeah. So for those who don't hold their mobile phones, I'll do that for you. So yeah, here's the eight ball that you shake it. I'm not going to shake my MacBook rather not. I'll just click on shake. <coughs> and yeah, so I make decision to continue with my presentation today because the outlook is good. Again, if you just again don't know how to decide, you may click on that and then you might get outlook not so good. So fortunately, we were on the first time uh, without problem or without a doubt in this. Uh, so let's continue with the presentation. So I will move uh, towards the best practices. So for the people that fall asleep, they consider themselves advanced, so please wake up if you want to. If not, just move on with your sleeping. Uh, it will be recorded anyway, so you can watch it later on. So, uh, what are the best practices for Lambda? First, is to minimize the package size to necessities. Don't put any bloated stuff that you don't need. Of course, if you are bringing your own runtime and uh, you need this Fortran to execute, I don't know what's going on in here. We are losing connection, just a second. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So just pack only the stuff that you need for your Lambda code to execute. I already mentioned <coughs> use environment variables. And uh, if you need to store any secrets, uh, use the function or the, the solution from AWS uh, that allows you to do it. Uh, because uh, sometimes you need to store in the or to use in the APIs, uh, in your Lambda code, sorry, API keys. Uh, database passwords and so on. So in that case, it's much better to use any kind of store secrets that are encrypted uh, and not to put it into the code as a, as a plain text. Uh, dependencies in your function package, I already mentioned, example with Fortran, uh, delete large unused functions. There is 75 gig li gigs limit per account per region. So if you have plenty of functions uh, that take 
total 75 gig limit, uh, you will be not able to create AWS uh, Lambda function. Not sure if this limit is hard or soft. If we can increase it, I would need to check the documentation, but just keep that in mind, not to go over that if possible. And uh, leverage max memory used to right size your functions. This is very important to keep in mind uh, because um, let me stop with that for two slides, three actually. So I already mentioned when you decide um, for your Lambda function, beside your placement name and the runtime environment, you choose how much RAM you want to use. And that's it. The minimum 128 uh, max comes uh, as, as a minimum, maximum 3 gigs. And with each chunk of memory that you put comes some ratio of CPU and the network performance. So of course it's logical, if you have the minimum functions with 128 max, it will have less CPU and less network performance than the one that has 512, for example, or 1 gig of RAM. So if your code is CPU or network dependent, you might end up of raising the amount of uh, RAM in your application. And I heard from some customers saying, yeah, this is just a waste of resources because we want to run it quickly, then we need to provision with larger uh, memories and so on. I'll give you an explanation why it might make sense. So imagine, uh, you have here some uh, lambda function that is CPU intensive, that means calculates 1,000 times all prime numbers that are smaller than 1 million. If you go with the smallest chunk of memory, uh, the function will run for almost 12 seconds. If you go with 1 gig of RAM, it will run almost 10 times less. So 1.5 seconds approximately. So the red is the worst, green is the best. Of course, more RAM means more CPU, more network performance. But what about the costs? You increase the, the amount of memory eight times more. So under normal circumstances, you would expect that it would cost eight times more. Might be not true, because look at the cost here and here. The difference is one, two, three, four, one, one, come on, one, one hundred thousand of, uh, of a dollar. Imagine that. You decrease the execution of your code considerably, 10 seconds, but it costs you more of zero, 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 one dollar. <coughs> Do your math before you decide what makes sense for you. Good. Another best practice. Keep orchestration out of the code. Uh, I saw many cases, and I'm guilty as well sometimes, uh, that uh, I try to trigger lambda function from my lambda function. Not a completely good idea, because there is a solution that allows you to do this orchestration much more elegant. It's called, let me skip that, AWS Step Functions. AWS Step Function is a serverless uh, workload management that, uh, again, zero administration, <coughs> but it allows you to set up this workflow of the uh, Lambda functions, also by getting the state uh, or the outputs and so on, and then decide on the next steps. So uh, automatically triggers and tracks each step, retries when there are errors, and so your application executes in order as you expect. So if you wanna uh, try step functions, highly recommend it. Monitor. If you don't measure, you don't know what's happening in your environment. As we like to say, metrics and logging are a universal right, at least on AWS platform. So Lambda and API Gateway uh, provide you seven built-in metrics uh, that I showed you uh, during the demo. Uh, includes invocation count, duration, errors, and so on. For API Gateways, uh, API calls, latency, 400, 500 errors, uh, and so on. And error and cache metrics also support averages and percentiles. So you can get up the statistics of your environment. How does the API gateway behave in 99% of the cases? This is an example how it looks like. 
Another service that will allow you to go even deeper than the monitoring that you have with CloudWatch, it's called X-Ray. Uh, X-Ray is a solution, ideal for developers, that uh, you can basically track what's happening inside your application. And actually, uh, the daemon, the X-Ray daemon, is available on all languages that are supported by AWS SDK. And here's the example. So you can see very detailed like what's happening on the dwell time, on the attempt, and so on. So you see all those uh, triggers or the time that it takes uh, to execute. It's highly recommended. Another best practice, leverage other serverless services. I mentioned that we introduced Lambda around end of 2014, but uh, when I started to think about, I realized that more than half approximately services are basically serverless. If you think about S3, object storage, there's no server for you to manage, right? It just provides you the capacity. DynamoDB, manage the database, no server to manage. SQS, uh, IoT, Cognito, Kinesis, all those are serverless services. AWS uh, allows you to stick those parts together. Like when I was small, small I was building this, this Lego stuff, you know, cars, buildings from the bricks. Here you can, by putting together all those services that are managed and are here for you, you can create great applications without having a single server. So, uh, let's speak a little bit about the patterns. Pattern number one are serverless web applications. Here's the example of uh, having a serverless uh, web page where we have the static content stored on S3, on the object storage. For those who have experience with AWS, you know that S3 by default can serve as a web server for the static content. So all uh, HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript functions you can put into your buckets. Uh, then you have uh, CDN, Content Distribution Network, especially when you need HTTPS, uh, so secure access or uh, encryption uh, in transit, because uh, S3 allows only HTTP, so well, from definitely makes sense. Uh, then for the uh, application execution or API execution, you have API Gateway, and if the API is triggered, Lambda can run and do, for example, store your data in Amazon, uh, in Amazon DynamoDB. If you need any kind of user authentication, you use Amazon Cognito. What about the security? There's no server to manage. There's no server to patch. There's no server to take care for high availability. So how does security of such application look like? So um, Amazon S3. Access on S3, you set up with bucket policies and access control lists. Uh, if you use CloudFront, you can actually provide content that it's not public at all through the uh, origin access uh, identity. So you just set up bucket policies that allows this specific CloudFront distribution to this specific bucket or part of the bucket and so on. Uh, I will be showing a demo in a moment, and I have to do it in my private account. Uh, I cannot do it on the corporate AWS account because I am exposing S3 publicly without CloudFront, so if the security team would see that, I would get called like 2 a.m. in the morning, and I would like to avoid that. So don't do that. Uh, with CloudFront, you can set up uh, things like geo-restrictions, signed cookies or signed URLs if you want to, and it has already built-in DDoS protection. Uh, DDoS uh, protection on AWS is basically provided by two services. First is AWS Shield, that has two versions, standard and advanced, standard free of charge, provided to all customers, advanced for the customers that decided to go for that, that want to support and so on, uh, and also buff, web application firewalls. So both solutions integrate with Amazon CloudFront, so you can protect your uh, web applications on layer 3 and layer 7 uh, on the uh, ESO stack. API Gateway, throttling, caching, we already mentioned, also some kind of DDoS protection integrated. Uh, both CloudFront and API Gateway can have certificates on them, so you can use SSL, encrypted communication, 
And then permissions for Lambda, we already mentioned that uh, IAM. So who can call a Lambda function and what can a Lambda function do in AWS? In this case, call DynamoDB. So this is how you can relatively easily uh, secure your serverless web application. And Cognito for user authentication. So let's go to demo number two today. Hmm. But before I go there, I will show you how the architecture looks like, actually. Very similar, like we saw before. So we have static content stored in a stream. I had to make it public because I don't have CloudFront distribution there. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript is in a stream. I set up the user authentication through Cognito. Uh, Cognito. Uh, then there is the API gateway call for the functions that are on the web page. Uh, that calls a Lambda function and stores the data of the writes in DynamoDB. So what is this wild writes? And you can, again, on the phone or notebook, if you have it open, you can go with me. And the page that we are going to open is actually HTTP bloodsimme. So this is how the great service looks like. It's actually a high rating service that is very similar to Uber. However, it's much, much better because it provides rides on unicorns, not just cars. The only problem is it's not available in Prague yet. Uh, I tried it, but I had to come with Metro anyway. Uh, and you will see that it's available only in Seattle. So if you ever travel to Seattle, you can try these applications. If the unicorns will come to you. So the first thing that you can do, and I did it during the testing, is to click on this giddy up and fill the registration. Basically, in the registration form, you just provide when it hopefully opens. If it's not, I have a link for that. Takes ages. Okay, seems like there's something wrong or the internet is slow. So, bloodsim me slash register HTML <coughs> and hope it works this time. No? Awesome. You know, that's the problem with all those applications that they work when you test it before the presentation. But when it comes to the presentation... Because nope. it's HTTPS, maybe. Uh, it might be. That I'm just copying the HTTPS. Thank you for that. Let's try. Yes, it tries to do HTTPS. And it will not work, of course, because it's HTTP only. Um, OK. <laughs> So probably I won't be able to show it to you, but let's try also in the Chrome, if it will be better or not. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes, come on, yes. right? Uh. So Firefox just does strange things sometimes on me, so thanks. Uh, so here you can register yourself uh, with, the, uh, with the email and password. The password has to have one character, like capital, then small. Then uh, one uh, uh, number and then some exclamation mark or whatever you want to use there. You don't have to use the real email, uh, but if you want to, you can because you will receive the confirmation code uh, that will uh, allow you to log into the application. I will. Uh, I'm already registered in here, so we'll show you how it looks like in Cognito. Because once you do this registration request, it creates the user account in the Cognito. So user pools. I, if you put there any fake uh, mm, email, I can... I see plenty of those. If anyone needs confirmation, just let me know. This seems like uh, fake uh, as well. So group, whatever, and, and so on. So I should be able to confirm those users that provided fake email addresses so and 
Here's one, two more unconfirmed, so let me do that. Unconfirmed. So, confirm. I have not seen me, no. That's a nice one. I like it. So, uh, once you have it, you can go to bloodsim slash sign in HTML. So if you recall your password that you put there and the fake email address that you put there or the real one, it's up to you. So I will do that right now. So I already have this stored, so I'll just sign in. It will take a while to log in the map of Seattle. As I mentioned, this service is available only in Seattle as of now. So let's assume I'm in Seattle and I need a ride with a unicorn and I need to and I want to set it up so where I will be waiting for my unicorn. So let's assume I will be somewhere in Capitol Hill. Uh, I will just request my unicorn. And you can see my unicorn, Rosinat or Rosinant, my yellow unicorn was on the way and has arrived so I can just jump in and then go wherever I want. So this is kind of funny application, uh, but as you can see, it's dynamic web page without a single server, only with those components that I showed you. So again, only S3, Cognito, API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB uh, that stores the, the rights uh, that are happening with those unicorns. So we can do any kind of analytics. So for example, increase uh, the prices for unicorns if it's congested and so on, if they are available. So yeah, uh, this is how the serverless web applications look like on AWS. Second pattern, serverless data lake. Uh, the data lake characteristic is that it uh, collects, stores, processes, consumes, and analyzes all, and I mean really all, organizational data. It's a kind of new concept, especially for companies that uh, used to uh, use uh, on-premises storage. Because after some time, they had to throw away all the data because the storage had some capacity uh, restriction or limit. Here is the center of, of the data like S3. It's virtually unlimited. So whatever data you put there, it's there and you can just up and add and add and so on. And then later on, do some kind of analytics you were not able to do before. Uh, the kind of data that you put there might be structured, like tables, uh, semi-structured, some you know, JSON, XML, or unstructured data, video, voice, pictures, and so on. Use them for AI ML, models creation, or uh, business intelligence analytics use cases. And uh, it, you don't need to create a schema during the write, but during the read, you decide which part of those files are important for you. And uh, the main thing is the storage and the compute is completely decoupled. As I mentioned, the basis is S3. Uh, regardless whether you use your own data lake setup or you use the lake formation service that we introduced uh, another uh, some uh, long time ago, uh, S3 will be always the center for storing the data. Then you have several ways how to ingest the data. Here are three of, I think, ten ways how you can put the data into AWS. So first two is using the Kinesis Streaming or Kinesis Firehose. So if you need uh, real-time streaming data or batched stream data, use Kinesis. If you have data on-premises in your uh, data center uh, somewhere here, let's say in Prague, you can set up the direct connect that is the uh, dedicated line for you between uh, the direct connect point and AWS environment. Then you can use other services for cataloging and search. Again, completely serverless, whether it's Dynamo, whether it's Glue, whether it's Elastic Search, although Elastic Search is kind of server-based, but you don't need to take care for the servers. Analytics and processing, Athena, quick site for visualization. Uh, of course, security and auditing, uh, putting permissions for the users to the IAM, uh, setting uh, encryption, data at rest with uh, KMS, and seeing what's happening in your environment with the cloud trail logs. And again, you can use Cognito uh, if you want to have user pools like we had in the application and API gateways and so on. Adam 3, stream processing. 
Streams uh, come in high in just trade because usually you have several sources that are putting the data into, into your streams and they, characterize, they are characterized by intermittent internet uh, connection. So sometimes the internet connectivity is uh, not there, so it's disconnected. And then when it's back there, it flushes all the data from the cache back to you. So you have to be ready uh, to kind of uh, react to spikes that might happen in the environment. Uh, here's the example of uh, putting the data into Kinesis Firehose. Again, several solution. Whether you have Kinesis agent or record producers using SDK, puts the data into the Firehose. Firehose triggers the Lambda for transformation or any kind of enrichment that you need to do with the data. Uh, stores the data in uh, DynamoDB, some metadata for the lookups. The transformed record are put back, uh, back to Firehose that they can store the buffered files in S3, in uh, Redshift, if you need any kind of data warehouse, BI kind of things on top of that, or Elasticsearch services if you need to search for the data later on. And you can also store the original raw data for further usage. If you decide not to use this enriched data and you might do any kind of new transformations on top of them. Another uh, sensor data collection, similar use case, this case in IoT, where you have sensors that send, send MQTT messages to the IoT core. Then you have uh, defined the rules that basically trigger, trigger actions a uh, different way. Storing the raw uh, reports in the S3 as your data lake, uh, putting into Kinesis streams uh, for real-time analytics applications, or Kinesis Firehose for patching those data into larger chunks. Last pattern, operation automation. Uh, automation characteristics uh, are usually events uh, triggered by some workflow. Uh, they might help you enforce the security policies. I will show you in an example. Uh, they can respond to alarms and so on. So here's the example of image recognition uh, that you can run your own. Here's a link to GitHub. Presentation will be available uh, to you so you can try it yourself. So here we have some web application where I have user that authenticates through a Cognito. So web application stores the data in the S3. Storing the data in S3 or object in S3 triggers a Lambda code. This Lambda code just goes through the AWS step functions that orchestrates the next steps. And the next steps are, first, extract image metadata from the picture that has been stored invoke Amazon recognition. So if you want to recognize any objects automatically that are on those pictures, you do this with the Amazon recognition service. Uh, you generate image thumbnail for whatever you want to use, and then you store the metadata and tags in DynamoDB. Here's a very nice example that is uh, used with many of my customers. So imagine you have enterprise environment, where you create security groups. Security groups, for those who don't know, is the virtual firewall for your service. And imagine that you have some new system administrator that does this thing. Opens RDP port, so remote desktop protocol for Windows servers, the whole internet. Don't do that in production, please. So what you can do is to have the CloudWatch events rule that basically checks if something like that happens. If it happens, it triggers the Lambda alert where Lambda deletes this security group automatically and also sends some alerts through the simple notification service, whether it's email, whether it's SMS message, and so on. So, where do you start if you want to do things with serverless, Lambda, and so on? You can do it like I did, but I'm not a developer per se, I'm the infrastructure guy, so programming Lambda functions in AWS console, probably it's not the best way, and not for developers at all, because you have all your good habits using your favorite, favorite IDAs, uh, integrated development environments, and so on. So for that, you use some framework. There are frameworks that are provided by AWS, like AWS uh, SAM, Amplify Chalice, and third party like Sparta for Go, Cloudia.js for Node.js, and so on. Uh, serverless application model, SAM, is the CloudFormation extent extension uh, that's uh, optimized for serverless. We already saw the example when I was deploying this 8-ball 
think uh, into into my Lambda uh, environment, uh, but it allows you to use new serverless resource types like functions, APIs, tables. It supports uh, anything that CloudFormation, this infrastructure as a code concept supports, and it's open specification with Apache 2.0 uh, license. There is also uh, some command line interface currently available uh, in beta, if I'm not wrong, that is CLI tool for local development. So if you want to locally develop Lambda, this is actually a feature that has been many times asked by uh, some of my customers, is there any way to develop Lambda locally without connection to AWS? Yes, now it is in beta. Uh, so it deploys a Docker container that emulates Lambda environment and you can develop it there. And if you are favorite of new IDEs, uh, Cloud9 might be the service to use. I use it from time to time. It's uh, browser-based. It runs in AWS, so you need internet connection for that. Uh, but it's easy to work with, and it's actually real fun. So, to end it up, if you, if any of you still have a doubt about the scale of uh, the services like Lambda, can they scale in production? Yes, they can, and we have many customers that basically confirm that. If you want any large-scale deployment, you don't need servers. You can use serverless solutions. Example might be Thomson Reuters that processes 4,000 requests for per second. But I like the FINRA example that processes half a trillion validation of stocks trades daily. So imagine that, how many Lambda calls that is, right? Or MLBAM, uh, it's a company that uh, does really cool things with baseball. I'm not a big fan of baseball, it's not a very European sport. But what these guys do with visualization and statistics, uh, I can actually show you um, here very quickly. It's one of the older videos, but hopefully it will be visible. Parts about having StackCats built on AWS is the ability to both scale the development team to continue to develop new features without wasting time trying to set up databases or information queues. But it also comes into the ability as we get more and more fan interest in this. Right now, six million people a day opening our app, we can provide infinite scalability. I'm Joe Anzarello. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Major League Baseball. When we were developing StackCast, we were very interested in trying to see what AWS could bring to the table versus an on-prem solution. In the past, we would have to implement that from scratch, roll our own on our own hardware and support it, as opposed to being able to jump right into developing the high-level business intelligence without having to do all the underlying work. It's much more empowering. The velocity of the market is something that's important to us. The thing about innovation that people often don't talk about enough is the ability to fail. If you're pushing the envelope, not everything you do should succeed. One of the things that's very provocative and very empowering about AWS is the ability to fail and fail quickly. That allows you to keep innovating. If you had to build data centers, see if they work, things like that, you do much less risky things because you just couldn't afford to fail. The cost of failure would be too high. The ability to innovate, drive technology, drive what we're bringing to the fan on AWS and not always be right is a very empowering thing from both a business and a product standpoint. Ultimately, AWS is clear leadership in this side and allows us to have speed to market in a way that we would have to develop a bunch of underlying technologies to achieve the business goal, as opposed to just starting with the state-of-the-art investment. So imagine if you are, I, hope, I was hoping that you will hear that uh, sound, but probably not that much. Uh, I was, uh, so imagine that you are a baseball fan and you can see all those statistics uh, that are happening uh, every, uh, every match. You can create a scenario, so what if what if this guy would make it to the first base on time, right? And you can do this with StatCast that MLBAM built on top of AWS. Most of this stuff is serverless. And this guy actually stores 17 plus petabytes of data per season. It's a lot of data. And uh, yeah, here are other examples. Uh, I like the driver and vehicle licensing agency that uh, in Great Britain is able to register license more than 47 million driver records. 
So if you will be doing something with the driver department here in Czech Republic, I suppose it's police department actually, and something will not work, just we call guys in Great Britain and do this on AWS and it just works. So um, who uses serverless besides those six examples I show you? Basically everyone. <laughs> but, uh, there are only a few use cases where Lambda doesn't make sense, and there are, of course, uh, but actually we have hundreds of thousands of customers that are using Lambda every month and triggering, triggering trillions of Lambda invocations every month. So, uh, the further resources uh, are here. Here I recommend you, if you will be then later on going through the presentation, here's the link to this demo I showed you with the wild ride, so you can deploy it yourself in your own environment. And uh, yeah, time for some questions.